Good morning and a beautiful day to you. How are you doing today? I hope you're having a lovely day. Today we are continuing our journey from South Africa, no no, from Scotland to South Africa in our Land Rover Lara, a journey my wife and I took 20 years ago and now getting around to telling the story. Oh, and today I'm joined by Ninja, my little cat. So, Mauritania, we have gone through Morocco, we have done the convoy, we've arrived at the border and we have arrived at Naudibu in Mauritania. What can I tell you about Mauritania? Well, it's mostly Sahara Desert. In fact, the eastern half, the whole eastern half of Mauritania, in what is, is inside what is referred to as the Sahara Desert's empty quarter, which is an amazing vast area of one and a half million square kilometers, one and a half million square kilometers, where there is not a single town in the entire area. That is incredible. That's one thing, that's half of Mauritania. A lot of the people here still live a nomadic lifestyle of, of roaming from place to place. And one of they are one of the biggest camel herders providers um, in the whole world. Um, that's about all I can tell you so far about Mauritania. So we have arrived at the border in a place called Naudibu, which is on the western coast of the Atlantic Ocean. It's just a little town wedged between the Sah between the Sahara Desert on one side and the Atlantic Ocean on the other. And uh, we'd overnighted there, done our paperwork, so officially out of Morocco and in Mauritania. Now we have the challenge of going anywhere because there's two big problems going south into Mauritania from Naudibu. In reverse order, secondly, there's no road. And the first problem is it's surrounded by a minefield. To go anywhere, the first thing you have to do is cross a minefield. Yep. And nothing reinforces this like a blown up Land Rover that is just outside the town of Naundibu that start that designates the start of the path through the minefield to get to the beach, which is the road to go south to Naukchot. And this Land Rover apparently was blown up fairly recently from when we were there because it went to help somebody who had got stuck in the sand. Uh -huh. hmm. So, up bright and early and queuing and basically once you're there, you, there's no, you're not guided through anything. You basically have to find your route through. Now, the instructions that you're given, and I hope this has changed a lot now, is that you follow the railway line, because there's a railway line that goes inland for quite a bit through parts of the desert before it goes south. Uh, so you follow the railway line 33 kilometers, making sure to stay on the south side of the railway line because the north side is mined. Then you turn south and wend your way through the minefield, uh, through the clear tracks, through the sand, and go to the beach and then you wait till the tide goes out because the Sahara sand dunes go right to the beach there. When the tide goes out you then drive down the beach, um, I think it's 560 kilometers to Naukchot. Sounds simple, hey? <laughs> so with a map, Michelin map, GPS in hand, we carefully set out sticking just to one side of the railway line, the south side of the railway line, and drive 33 kilometers and then we turn right and you can see there is a break in the sand dunes there where you can see all the traffic then head south. It's at this point we meet the French people again. Remember the French people I told you who wanted to do the um, convoy with us in case they got stuck? Well actually no, they actually wanted to do this section with us. They had left earlier than us and they were already in the top end of the minefield. So we turn down into the minefield and the first thing we encounter is Claude. Well, we don't actually encounter Claude. Well, we do. He's sort of a, an atypical French man. He's standing behind his one wheel drive Mercedes that is stuck in the sand on the edge of the minefield, casually eating an orange and waving at us as we drive up. He's got stuck 100 meters down the path towards the minefield and he's already stuck. 
He's one of these guys who bought a car in France and was going to sell it in goodness knows where and then fly back. Um, and he had a, a low-slung Mercedes. Not, not a four-wheel drive, but normal. And this wasn't even a two-wheel drive because his rear axle was broken and it was only supplying power to one, t- one wheel and he got stuck. And we, fortunately for him, unfortunately for us, came right behind him. So we helped dig him out, push him a little bit, get him down the track, but unfortunately now he's ahead of us. And there is only one route through, well, one main route through the minefield if you want to stay on the main track. And when you're crossing a minefield, you want to stay on the main track, trust me. So we push him, get him ahead, and then we wait a little while, then we trundle through, and it's not a difficult path, certainly for a Land Rover. I don't think I even engaged four-wheel drive at this section. It came down, three kilometers later, there's Claude stuck, not on the main route because the main route at that point got quite sandy and he decided to take a diversion round and got stuck. Now this is a minefield now basically there's lots of different tracks of different degrees going around and the trouble with minefields in sand because sand is where it goes is dictated by the wind and the sand dunes and the mines are in the sand which shift backwards and forwards through the sand dunes which is why It's a very bad idea, A, to put mines there, and B, to then drive through it when there's mines there. But anyway, um, so he's veered off the track a little bit, and he's now stuck. And he wants help again. And it's sort of like, we remember the Land Rover at the beginning of the trail that went to help somebody, and that Land Rover got blown up because it hit a mine, and nobody could ever tell us what happened to the people, if the people survived or not, but the Land Rover didn't look in pretty condition. And you're sort of weighing up, you know, I can't really leave this guy here to possibly die in the edge of the desert, but it is his own responsibility and potential stupidity to do it. And now he's putting me at risk. But in good conscience, I how we had to help. But I didn't drive the Land Rover into the there and pull him out. Instead, I got my sand plates out, got the spade out and went over and started digging to dig him out. And he's frantically saying, no, no, pull, pull, pull. And I'm going, no, 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 and I'm not, because I would have to go round him away from the path to then pull him out the other side, which could risk blowing my Land Rover up and me from a minefield. Oh, no, 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 we'll do this the old fashioned way. It might take longer, it might take a lot more sweat. And believe me, it was hot already. But we will dig this car out and push it out. So... We're digging, I get the sand and he's digging. He has nothing, he has no water. He has nothing to dig with. He's digging with his hands and his only supplies is a big bag of oranges. That's all he has. I really should have left him there, shouldn't I? Anyway, I didn't. So I'm digging away, conscious that I could be in a, that I am in a minefield. And I'm and I, and I, I I go, I pull the spade, push the spade in, it goes clunk against something, like hard and solid. And everybody stops and looks at me. And I'm like, well, we haven't blown up. That's a good thing. And I take that, I scrape away carefully around, and I'm like, what happens if I find a mine? And I thought, well, if, if it goes off delayed. Fortunately, it was just a big chunk of rock. <laughs> but boy, that got the blood pressure go pumping. So, continue digging him out a little more carefully, but yeah, it's at this point you've committed. You dig him out, shoved him on, and he got going again. And then we went back to the Land Rover, had some water, freshened up a little bit, put the sand plates, put our sand plates away, put our spade away, got in, and thought, well, how long do you think we should wait before he's far enough ahead that we don't catch him again? And it's all like, yeah, but we've got to get down to the, we've got to get through the minefield, we've got to get to the beach, we've then got to drive down the beach, and this is a long journey and it's tide dependent, so we didn't really have much time to spare. So, off we went. Sure enough, we got about another five kilometers before there he there was Claude and his Mercedes stuck in the sand again. Fortunately, a little more on the main track. Again, we dug him out, pushed him, and off he went. A little bit further though, the two, there were two main paths that diverged, and most people went down to the um, the inland path, which went followed the railway line for a little bit, and then swung inland, and then went out to the beach. But it's a much longer road, whereas with a four-wheel drive, we could cut over a couple of sand dunes and take a more direct path to the beach. So at that point, our paths diverged, and we never saw Claude again. For all we know, he might still be there. 
if anybody goes through there, give him my regards as you pass. He's a French guy with a bag of uh, oranges in a Mercedes. Um, so we went over these sand dunes and you then slip down and you then head directly, was it, west to the coast following some GPS points um, that we had acquired. And an hour later, sure enough, we saw the sparkling Atlantic Ocean on the edge of the Sahara Desert and we dropped down onto the beach. Now we had another problem. We're onto the beach and you have to follow the beach down. That's it. Once you're on the beach, the only path from there is down south following the beach. But we didn't know what the tides were. Now there's no internet. We had no information um, and we were <laughs> thinking that when we got there to the beach, we would ask the locals as to about the tide time. When we got to the beach, there was nobody there. Absolutely nobody there. There is nothing there. So we're like, okay, so let's have a look. I mean, the beach looks fairly big. Is the tide in? Is the tide out? We don't really know. Um, and the locals also get caught out. And the problem is, there is some parts of the desert, the big sand dunes come so close to the beach that the tide comes right up. So if you get caught in those sections, you will get your car, vehicle will get washed out to sea and bogged in the sand and woof, you've got to walk the rest of the way. And considering it's only our second country in Africa on our tour, we didn't want to lose the Land Rover at this point. So we were a bit hesitant, um, but we watched the tide for an hour and saw that the beach was getting bigger. So we thought, okay, so we've got a window of opportunity. So we then drove down the beach. So we drove for about an hour before we came to a piece of string strung up across the beach and a one and little hut and a tiny little hut smaller than this room that I'm filled <laughs> that I'm in now um, and we stopped and as we stopped this guy came out of the hut and uh, he was jabbering away I have no idea what he was saying um, uh, but basically that part of the beach is actually a national park in Mauritania and you have to pay an entrance fee. <laughs> um, so I went into the hut. It's a very minimal fee it was of those days. Paid him his fee and uh, he took the piece of string down and uh, I asked him, you know, tides, time and everything. And we were having big communication problems. And he was jabbering away in whatever language he spoke. I was jabbering away in English. And uh, eventually we got the message through what we wanted. So he went and got a fisherman. And um, the fisherman spoke a little bit of English, uh, mixed with French, and we speak a little bit of French, mixed with English. And between us, he basically said he wanted to go to Naukchot too. So if he could have a lift, he'd help us navigate the way, and um, we could manage the tides between us. Oh, well, that's a great idea. What better person to help us with the tides and where to stop on the way down than a fisherman? Sounds good, hey? So he hopped in the back, and he said, yes, we can go now. Go, 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 go now. And uh, admittedly, that part that you pay a national park fee, I mean, they don't do anything. I mean, they just charge you to go through. They don't maintain the park. It's beach and sand dunes. But there is absolutely amazing bird life along that area. It really is beautiful. And the, the Atlantic Ocean roars up against the Sahara Desert. It is a desolately beautiful area. If it isn't for the worry that you think, well, you know, especially when you go through some of those areas where the sand desert comes so close to the beach, that you look nervously in the water is always way too close on your other on the right hand side as you're driving down and a lot of the time you actually are driving in the shallows so you know it, there's a lot of spray coming up and it's, visibility is terrible as well you've got sand and salt and when the waves crash out the spray comes over the windscreen the wind then whips in from the desert and piles all the sand on it and the windscreen wipers which aren't particularly adequate on those older uh, Land Rover defenders anyway like <laughs> scrape across the windscreen you have to stop clear the windscreen before you go on but we went for about a two hour section down there really admiring the beauty but also conscious that we really need to to get a move on and um, then we came to a part where the tide was right up again you could see the tide had already come in and um, the guy in the back was saying we go, we go up we go up I was looking to the left and right. he wanted to go up that sand dune I know I've got a Land Rover, but that, you know, you know, no, we must go. Tide's coming in. So it's like, but you said it was okay. No, we must go in. Tide coming in. Oh, my goodness. So we found a gap where we could barely just, like, drive up into the sand dunes. About 10, 11 feet up is all we got. 
Um, and then there was a little plateau where we parked and then we had to wait for the tide. And that's all you can do. We sat there, the three of us, we cut our chairs out. We had two chairs, so he had to sit on the ground, poor guy. We made some tea, <laughs> typical British style, made a fire, put the kettle on, <laughs> made a cup of tea or mug of tea, and just admired the absolute desolate, empty beauty of the place. And it wasn't particularly pleasant because the wind was blowing off the sea. It was really sort of like semi-hazy. We were now to sort of mid-afternoon and we had to wait the cycle for the tide to come in and then the tide to go out. And we just sat there and waited. Sure enough, the tide came in, then the tide, eventually the tide starts to go out. By this time, it's now late afternoon. At, uh, um, and the first thing we have to do is then go slip back down onto the beach and test if it's firm enough now with the tide going out. Because the trouble with tide going out is that a lot of the water comes under the sand and you can't see it. And it's very then easy for a heavy vehicle like a Land Rover to go to get stuck. And that we did not want to do. Um, have you ever dug in wet sand? Uh-uh. Um, so when we were happy and confident that the tide was far enough out and the sand was firm enough, we were back down there and trundling along through, um, along the beach. Uh, but now this time driving was really taxing because it was late afternoon, the light was bad, the wind was whipping the sand and the surf, it was, it was not pleasant, it was quite nerve-wracking driving. Plus, you have to watch out for fishing lines, fishing, uh, big fishing lines and anchor lines because some of the boats come and anchor um, along there, then they just pull the anchor across the beach and hook it on the beach and you're driving along that, so you have to swerve around them, keep an eye out for all these things and it's... it's incredibly taxing. Then we came to the first time where I seriously thought, seriously thought I was going to lose the landy. Because there's one section where whether the tide is in or out you have to cut into the desert. Because the, the, the sand dunes just go straight into the sea, low or high tide, there's no beach. It's about a 10 kilometer stretch. So we turned up and the first part was really good but then, the, then there's multiple tracks different options so you just take the one that uh, looks the firmest and starting to use the seriously use the four-wheel drive um, low range going through these things but the landy plows through it but then there's one like peak section in the middle where the, the sand dune peaks once you've crossed that is downhill down to the beach on the other side but it's one narrow path there is only one path through and you really have to gun it to get up this is where we learnt to force the uh, may the force be with you, the, the phrase that they have in Mauritania when you come to these big sand, sand dunes, beaucoup de force, plenty of force. So basically, you come up to the bottom of this sand dune and you gun it and get over the top and you breach over the top because you mustn't go slowly over the top of sand dunes. You breach over the top, come down the other side and then you're away. So we psych ourselves up and we gun it and we're gunning up there and the Land Rover is doing fine. As we're doing it, this another vehicle comes over the top towards us and there is only, there is no way past. Now where we come to a standstill eight tenths of the way up and they've just gone over the top and they're on the way down. Both vehicles stop and get stuck. Almost nose to nose, almost to the top of this sand dune. It's like, oh my goodness. So it, um, and we had to stop because we nearly collided. I mean, it, it was, <laughs> uh, and there's no way he could back up, reverse up and then down the other side. And the, we were so close to the right hand side of the sand dune, which fell down to the sea for about 200 meters, that um, for me to reverse down all that way was go also going to be exceptionally dangerous because in sand, you don't always go forward. You often go sideways as well as forward. Makes life very tricky. So we then negotiated very slowly going past each other on this narrow track up a sand dune in serious four-wheel drive territory. And as we're just passing each other, unfortunately, I was on the right hand side, the extreme side by the almost cliff that went down to the sea. And we were about one metre away from the edge when the bit of the edge collapsed and the Land Rover like... Ugh. Now Land Rovers are very good four wheel drive vehicles but they have one flaw, especially the old Defenders. They 
left side to side tippiness is their vulnerability. They you, you tip them two side, you know, going up, they can walk up a 45 degree angle, no problem. But tip them left to right, too far, especially as we had a roof rack and lots of heavy things on the roof, making it a bit top heavy, very easy to roll over. If we tipped too far, we were gonna roll down over the edge and then roll down into the sea, basically. At, uh, and I sat in the Land Rover and my heart was in my mouth and I seriously thought, oh my goodness, our journey is over. This could be the end. We are now stuck on top of a sand dune, on top of a several hundred meter drop, tipping to one side in, Mar in some end of place nowhere in Mauritania. That it really was one of those moments, life affirming moments. The vehicle had stopped, we got out, we assessed the situation, and it was like not pretty. I mean, it, it was not good. Now by this time, fortunately, the other vehicle had gone past, so they'd got past us, we didn't have them to worry about, and fortunately they stopped to give us some help. So what we had to do is, we borrowed their sand plates and our sand plates, we carefully dug down the left-hand side of the Land Rover until it was level. We basically had to dig through the sand dune until the Land Rover became level. As we were doing that, we were shoving and building up the right-hand side, the drop side, with the sand plates, shoving them under the tyres, and then building it up with any rocks we could find, which is not many, because there's none on the beach, and we're in a desert. So we're finding anything we can to shove underneath it to give it some solid base, so we can then get some traction and get over the crest and down the other side without falling into the Atlantic Ocean. It took us about two hours of preparation, and even then I was not confident. I wouldn't let Jennifer into the vehicle while I was doing this, because if it's gonna roll over, it might as well just take one of us rather than both. Although what she'd do when I'd gone, I have no idea. Let's not discuss that. Um, and then, yes, rolled back a little bit, because we'd put the sand blade so I could roll back and then get good traction and then zip up. Rolled back and then gunned it. Now. Gunning it on a Land Rover is not like a normal car because they've got a low, lot of low range torque, not a lot of high speed takeoff. You never see a Land Rover, you know, flying off at a traffic lights, do you? And, and especially a diesel one. And we, so instead of gunning, we chugged forward as with as much, much beaucoup de force as possible. And we launched off the sand plates and there was a horrible moment when we got off the sand plates and immediately the vehicle tipped to the right. And I was like, it's so difficult because you mustn't turn the wheels to the left, which is your intuition, because that then tips the balance more to the right. You have to actually steer into the lean, which means you're trying to steer the vehicle over the edge of the drop, but you have to fight your instinct. And it was so difficult not to swerve away from the, the tipping side. You steer slightly into it and the vehicle is getting more and more. And then you're trying to keep it straight and you're trying to keep it going and and we made it. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, it, it, we, we, as we were sort of like, you know, running out of room to move to the right hand side, we came over the top. I <laughs> wailed that reel, wheel over to the left as we breached the top, landed, and it's a bit firmer on that side, and we came nice and level and away from that edge came to a standstill there while all the people behind were cheering, yay, yeah, we made it. And I was very thankful that we did. But we'd made it the other side, picked up the sand plates, thanked the other people, we shared some water, Jennifer got back in, our fisherman friend got back in, and it's time to head back down to the safety of the beach. But by this time, unfortunately, it was almost dark and we still had over a hundred and some kilometers to cover on the beach and the tide was starting to come in again. This delay on the sand dune, relief though it was to survive, had set us back quite a bit. So I then had to drive down the beach and I was tired, we'd got up early, been hot, been sweaty, we'd got stuck, we'd got terrified, we'd idled away hours waiting for the tide to go out and I was battling to keep my eyes open. The visibility was terrible. There was sand and the, the sea. And basically, as you approach Nelkchot, um, it gets worse and worse because there's a lot more high winds coming in. Uh, a lot of high winds were coming in off the sea and blowing across that. The beach gets nice and big, so there's no problems with, with dodging the tide. 
but you get a lot of sea salting wind battering one side of the vehicle and sand battering the other. And I was battling to keep awake and I thought, oh, we must be so there. Land Rover lights, we didn't have any extra lights, also not really great at illuminating. And I don't think I'd quite fallen asleep, although I was close to it, because I thought I was dreaming because suddenly there was this massive ship looming out of the darkness towards me. I mean, like, and I was like, whoa, swerving. And I was like, and I was like oh, well, that really woke me up. And we're just about to Naukachot. And there is dozens and dozens of abandoned, massive boats that have just been beached on the beach there. Um, and they're just left there rotting. And so in some ways it was a good sign because we were nearly there, but also it was quite terrifying. And then there's all these ropes and anchor lines from the old boats and the new boats that are all just strand on the beach there and the fishing fleets that are there. You then have to wend your way uh, through all these things, over the anchor cables, under the anchor cables, around these massive boats. And at this point you then have to find the one turning <laughs> in the dark, in an almost abandoned place, that you turn off the beach and then you can actually pick up a road, we were looking forward to a road, um, that then takes you into Nauchot. So it still took us another hour to find a gap in the sand dunes to break from the beach to the main road. We then got to the road and it still wasn't a tar road, it was a semi-sandy gravel road, which was still better. Actually the first time for quite a while we'd actually managed to disengage four-wheel drive. And we rolled into Naukchot and we were so happy to be wherever Naukchot was. Our fisherman directed us to where he wanted to be dropped off, dropped off, yep, thank you very much. And off he went, not that he'd actually been any use to us really at all, although he did do a good bit of digging, I'll give him that. Um, and we then had to find somewhere for the night.